Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 480th New Social Environment. I'm Ty, the Senior Production Assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation about the artist Martin Ramirez, featuring Victor Espinoza, Frank Maresca, and Lyle Rexer. We are thrilled to welcome poet Lily Lady here, who will read to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on the Nape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you all to check the chat in just a moment for a living document of resources and actions. And now to introduce today's guests and host, Assistant Professor in the Department of Sociology at The Ohio State University, Newark, Victor Espinoza, is the author of Martin Ramirez, Framing His Life and Art. His most recent publication, Performances of Suffering in Latin American Migration, Heroes, Martyrs, and Saints, is a collaborative book with OSU performance study scholar, Ana Elena Puga, that combines historical, sociological analysis and the theater performance studies lens to understand how migrant suffering is framed and staged by migrants, activists, artists, and advocates to claim human rights for undocumented migrants. American art dealer Frank Maresca is co-founder of Rico Maresca Gallery in New York City. A long-term advocate of self-taught folk and outsider art, he has championed and showcased the work of artists creating on the margins of the art historical mainstream for over 35 years. Through many gallery exhibits, museum collaborations, philanthropic work, and key publications, Maresca has sought to blur the lines that have traditionally separated conventional categories in visual art and vernacular art. He is currently on the advisory board of Raw Vision Magazine, Fountain House Gallery, Intuit in Chicago, and the Art Dealers Association of America. And our lovely host for the day, Lyle Rexer, is a writer and sometime curator. He is the author of several books on outsider art, including How to Look at Outsider Art and Jonathan Lerman, The Drawings of an Artist with Autism. He teaches at the School of Visual Arts. Please take it away, Lyle. Uh, thank you, Ty. Uh, it's great to be back, actually. Uh, I want to say a couple of things before we get rolling. Um, first of all, I want to thank the rail. Uh, I want to thank Fong and Ty and, uh, and Nick uh, and everybody associated with these productions. I think this is probably the fifth or sixth um, uh, new social environment that I've hosted. And it's just every time it's just been a wonderful pleasure and really kind of a privilege for me to be able to talk to some of my people, favorite people, people I really admire and whose work I'm uh, uh, entranced by. Uh, it's a great opportunity, so I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank Victor Espinosa uh, for, for participating. Uh, I was just in the, uh, in the process last night of rereading an essay that, that he wrote uh, several years, years ago on Ramirez, and it was a, a tremendously moving experience. I'd forgotten just exactly how gripping uh, the story was. So it's it's great that that Victor's here. He probably has already forgotten more than we'll ever know about Martin Ramirez. So <laughs> it's great to have him here, and and Frank Maresca, uh, who I've known for quite a while. And um, in the interest of full disclosure, I've done a lot of projects with Frank and the gallery. And Frank is one of the people who was responsible for actually me becoming uh, an art writer. Uh, one, some of my earliest art writing was done uh, in collaboration with Frank. So it's, it's really wonderful to have him as part of this conversation as well. Um, I was thinking that, uh, and we talked about this yesterday in our kind of run through uh, for, for the discussion today. Um, in going over the work of Ramirez, there's a, um, really three things it seems to me that we, we, we need to dive into. Uh, the first, because we have the, the expert here, uh, is Ramirez's life, uh, and over the course of the last 15 years, uh, largely because of Victor Espinosa's work, we now know a great deal about what had been a very enigmatic artist, uh, really very little more than a name to most people. Uh, now we know a great deal, and that biographical information has, has helped us a lot to understand the work. So uh, diving into the life is important. The second thing we need to dive into, and I think is very intriguing, something Frank can speak to, uh, I think, in detail, is the, uh, the career of the art itself. That is, how did it go from this thing that was re really pretty much treated to some degree as a symptom of a disease or of, of mental illness 
to a place where these drawings are now valued around the world. And uh, if you happen to, and I urge you to do this, visit the, um, the, the uh, exhibition at Rico Maresca Memory Portals, which is some of the late work of Martin Ramirez. Uh, that work is now valued at hundreds of thousands of dollars. So how did, how did that happen? How did we go through that incredible evolution of value? And the last thing, of course, is the work itself, which I hope we have time to kind of dive into in detail. It's fascinating work. And again, because of Victor's work over the last 20 years or 15 years, uh, we have ways into the work that are enormously compelling and moving. So those are the three things I thought we'd have a chance to, to deal with today and that we should have our hands full. Um, but there's a short video. Uh, it would be wonderful to play that. It's a kind of walkthrough of the exhibition and, and uh, Ty's just gonna let this run. And we'll just take a quick look. It's about, about a minute and plus. This is what the exhibition looks like, but you have to see it in the flesh. Uh, I should point out as we go through this, um, the, the show at Rico Maresca is, is very, very interesting in that this is all late work. It was work that was discovered after the kind of main body of Ramirez's drawings had been uh, it more or less become familiar, shall we say. Uh, and this was a remarkable find, an absolutely astonishing cache of drawings, almost as large as the, the original group. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, I like to think of this show as very much late work. And it's one of the things I wanna to talk to my, my two experts about, um, about, the, about the evolution of, of Ramirez as an artist, uh, but we'll get to that. Uh, the, what I like to open with is something that I, I think is, is quite close to all of us. Um, and that is our first experience with Ramirez's work uh, on a personal level. What was it like? How did it feel? What kind of experience was it uh, for each of us? And um, I know a little bit more about Frank, but Victor, I'd love to hear you talk about just your, your early experience with seeing the work and, and how much that meant and what that felt like. Uh, first, uh, thank you for inviting me. I am, yes, yes, I'm really enjoying this. And thank you for organizing this. Always is a wonderful opportunity to share or to talk about Ramirez. I can talk about Ramirez for hours. And we <laughs> <laughs> we had a chat yesterday. We were planning to chat only for 10 minutes about Ramirez just to check that everything was fine. And we ended up talking for 40, 45 minutes. And <laughs> Frank suggested, please just keep talking until tomorrow. <laughs> so talking about Ramirez is, is fun. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question because this takes me to really uh, uh, back back memory to many, many, many long uh, years ago when I, I used to live in Mexico and I was uh, still, I remember I was already in a master, I mean, uh, starting a master degree in Mexico. Uh, let, let me know, let me go back, back, back even before. Uh, Ramirez had an exhibition in 1989 in Mexico. It was an extremely su successful exhibition. It was in Mexico City. And I grew up in a city that is six hours from Mexico City. It's called Guadalajara. And I went there to college and I, I, I used to live there. So in those years, I was a, as an undergraduate student. So I didn't have the money to go to, to go to Mexico City to see Ramirez exhibition. But the Ramirez exhibition was all the time in the in ads and the TV. There were a couple of articles in, 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 in newspapers. I, my my uh, oldest bro my elder brother is my brother, Rubén Espinosa. He's a painter. He's an uh, an art professor in, in Mexico. And we talk a lot about art. And we talk about Ramirez. And he was extremely impressed by his art. Uh, I think he also, he didn't have the time to go to Mexico City to see the exhibition. 
but he he was able to get a poster of the exhibition and he had the poster in his, in his studio. So I started looking Ramirez art as an art for the first time just with conversation with my with my brother. But also I used to work with an specialist of, of migration in those years when I was undergraduate, and he had the chance to go to Mexico City and see the exhibition. Uh, my, uh, my he he was not my professor, but he I, I used to work with him. He's, he's an anthropologist, and he he also is an art collector. His name is Jorge Duran, and he was an he's an anthropologist, very well known in Mexico. But he also collected art, and he was especially interested in the art produced by untrained artists. But also he was an specialist in, in, in migration, and I I worked with him, so he went to see the exhibition, and he he get back just impressed by the exhibition. And he got the catalog of the exhibition. Well, it was a beautiful book published by, by published in 1989 that includes uh, Randall Moore's article, includes uh, an article by Octavio Paz. It's a beautiful book. And for many years, it was the reference for everybody else. Uh, so I read the book from the beginning to the end, not only one time, but a couple of times. But let me tell you something. If you see Ramirez and, and reproductions, especially you see Ramirez in a magazine or in a book, it's not the same. It's never going to be the same that seeing Ramirez uh, in original. And I didn't know about this. So at the beginning, at the tell you the truth, the art didn't attract much to me because I was just seeing a small uh, reproductions in a very in a magazine. Uh, so, but still the, the story became very, very interesting to me because he was an immigrant and I was interested in migration studies, even when I was an undergraduate student. So then a couple of years later, I, I moved to the United States. I moved to Milwaukee. And you know, Milwaukee is uh, the, the Milwaukee Art Museum has been interested in Ramirez for many, many years. And they received the Ramirez exhibition in, in the 1980s. So when I moved to, to Milwaukee, one of the first things was to open the newspaper and learn that the Milwaukee Art Museum have received a couple of Ramirez in the permanent collection. It, the, the, those were alone from, from Jim Nett. So then Ramirez came again to my life. I, I, I made contact with the director of the, of the museum. I, was, I had a chance to see the, the pieces. And it was just stunning to see a couple of Ramirez for the first time in my life. And then came the exhibition that Lel Salon has organized in the 19, I think it was in the 1980s, that included, I don't remember, like a 15 pieces by Ramirez. I saw, I saw that exhibition, for, and I, it was really at that moment when I say, I have to do something. This art is amazing, and it's very sad what we are reading the labels. And we have to do something. There is something, uh, something here in this art that we need to uncover. Just to be, to, to be very short here with you is uh, very precise. In those years, I'm talking about a time when people didn't know where, where he was born. They have a very imprecise, imprecise dates about when he was born and when, when he died, even the, 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 the year of his death, death was wrong. Uh, so the basic information just was reduced to four facts that were incorrect. They didn't know the exactly the place where he was born. He just referred him as a psychotic that was mute and things like that. You, you know, you know the myth about it. You know the story. So this is this is when I I went I get back from my uh, from this exhibition to my house when I said you know I have I have I have to do a research about this. And then with all the been to the start for me uh, about tracking Ramirez's background first in California and then going back to Jalisco. And you know the story, I was able to find a still a couple of, couple of relatives alive. But you were asking me about the art itself. So this is how I became uh, uh, connected with this project because I was highly impressed by his work. Um, and uh, later I uncovered with my research that, that people who saw Ramirez drawings in the art institution, people who saw Ramirez drawings for the first time in one of the first exhibitions in the 1950s, Every single one who was exposed to Ramirez had, had, had similar reaction to the ones we are having now. So yeah, <laughs> Ramirez are, we can say that speaks by itself, but of course I don't believe, I don't believe completely that idea. This is why I have to do a research because we need to put that in context. And one of the things I found is that Ramirez brought what really that didn't speak by itself by many people. This mm -hmm. is why many of his art were destroyed. And also, this is why even uh, in the 1950s, people uh, were not interested in organizing any exhibition by Ramirez. You know, I found that, for example, Tarmo Pasto, he offered Ramirez work to many different institutions around the country. He even offered the Ramirez drawings to the MoMA and to the Guggenheim to organize exhibition in the 1950s, and nothing was done. 
So the only people who respond, uh, respond to Alfasto was uh, the Syracuse University and they organized an exhibition in 1958. Of course, I am talking about exhibitions that uh, the ones he was involved. Yeah. So yes, just to be sure, I think this, I, this is enough to, to start from. Yeah, and I, I, you, you mentioned a whole bunch of things that I wanna come back to. I wanna talk about the myth of Martin Ramirez. I wanna talk about how that myth gradually was uh, dismantled. And, and, and that's been enormously important. But before we do that, Frank, I'm very interested in your earlier experiences of Ramirez's work. Uh, I think we all have something in common when it comes to seeing this work for the first time. Well, Vic, you know, Victor covered, uh, really covered a lot of, a lot of ground. And um, his first experience with Ramirez and my first experience with Ramirez was vis-a-vis the legendary uh, art dealer, Phyllis Kind. Uh, Phyllis Kind is uh, sadly no longer with us, but um, has left a lot behind. And one of those things that she's left behind uh, was my sort of early beginnings and uh, uh, initiation really into, into the world of Martin Ramirez. So I was va very vaguely uh, aware of the artist as a as a young art dealer and as a dealer that um, uh, had only really just begun to delve into the world of self-taught and outsider art. And I walked into the Phyllis Kind Gallery. Um, you had to sort of know Phyllis. She was a brilliant and really outrageous person. And uh, was meeting her for the first time and we started talking and um, she said that you have to see the work of Martin Ramirez and uh, we went we walked over to a different part of the gallery and there hanging on the wall was um, a work that was probably two and a half foot wide and maybe six and a half foot tall it was an abstracted train coming out of an abstracted tunnel and it was just, it was just absolutely immediate for me. Uh, it, it, people talk about an, a, having an epiphany in, in art, something that changes one's life forever. And uh, it was for me that moment in the Phyllis Kind Gallery, standing there in front of this work, I'd never seen a, a never seen a work uh, in the flesh, so to speak. And Phyllis started talking to me about the work. Um, and as Victor said, um, even though Phyllis Kind was sort of the, the dealer of note uh, at that point in time, and we're, we're talking about uh, 1979, I can hardly believe it, but 19, <laughs> 1979. And Phyllis was telling me that um, this was a person who uh, was institutionalized in California. He was uh, a deaf mute, completely isolated. And uh, I sort of took that uh, as, as gospel, as, as did everyone really at the time. Um, but I guess the point, the, the point is, um, that I couldn't get away from the work. I just could not, the work just, it, it just absolutely grabbed me. It, gra it grabbed me in, 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 in the same way that, that uh, a, a terrier would grab a rat and just, and just shake it. I was, I was shaken to the bone by this work. And so as a result, of course, I had to buy it. Even though it was, it was more money than, than, than I could ever imagine spending. Um, and I remember just sitting at Phyllis Kind's desk and, and for some reason I had a check with me and I was writing out a check for the Ramirez and I couldn't stop my hand from shaking. I just couldn't believe it. Um, but, uh, but I'm so happy that I did. And of course uh, it set the stage for this incredible journey uh, that is still going on all of these years later. I mean, you can do the math from 1979 
and for, until now. For all of uh, us, for all and, of us. And I, and, and I think it's totally remarkable that, you know, through circumstance, through luck, through chance, through coincidence, through uh, all of the things that, that, that make our lives, you know, what, whatever, whatever they are, uh, 15 years ago, um, we were chosen uh, by the Ramirez family, the estate of Martin Ramirez, to represent the body of work. Yeah, which was a re remarkable, a remarkable turn of events. I remember vividly when that happened. Uh, um, yes, yeah, so it was really quite astonishing. I, I'll be brief. I want to add my own sort of little anecdotal thing here. Um, I too had a, let's say, an epiphanic moment with Ramirez. Uh, I'd seen the work and not knowing what it was at all in a, in a very controversial show at the Brooklyn Museum in the 1980s called uh, Hispanic Art in America. Uh, for me, that was an enormously important show, uh, even though it was very controversial and there was a lot of griping about what was in the show. In that show were pieces by Martin Ramirez. And in fact, Ramirez was kind of the lead artist in that show, which was really a shot across the bow of people who are interested in contemporary art. And that was, that really got my attention. Also the fact that Octavio Paz was writing about the, about the work and dealing with it as artistic production and not as a species of folk art. All those things were on my mind. And then I was working with Frank on various outsider projects and I got a call from a friend of mine and he has seen the show in Mexico city. Uh, so, in the back of his mind in the mid 1980s uh, or, or late 1980s. And it, in the back of my mind, I, I, I kind of knew sort of what he was, I knew that he'd seen it. He called me from upstate New York from, a, from, a, uh, from an antique store, or let's call it a secondhand shop. And in that secondhand shop was a picture. That picture was about four feet tall and it was a niche picture, very much like some of the ones you'll see uh, of a deer in the niche. And um, it, it turns out that that's an enormously important image for Ramirez. He comes back to the deer over and over again uh, in various different postures and, and situations, shall we say. And so we talked uh, uh, over the phone a little bit and he was kind of hemming and hawing about whether he should buy the drawing. And I finally just got so frustrated listening to him talk to me that I said, look, just stay there. I wanna come up and see it. So. My wife and I got in the car, we drove up two hours to, uh, I think it was High Falls, New York, walked into the antique store and it was very much like seeing a Rembrandt, finding a Rembrandt in your attic. There was this absolutely astonishing drawing. And to be in the presence of that, even though I'd seen work before, but to see this thing just kind of in this place, well, it turns out the backstory was almost as interesting. And this will lead into questions I wanna ask Victor, about the life of Ramirez. Turns out that the picture had come, was owned by the woman who owned the antique store. She had been a psychiatric nurse in California and later at Bellevue in New York. And wherever she went, she had sort of collected work that had been done by people who were institutionalized. And her story was that she had a boyfriend who had been institutionalized in the same institution as Martin Ramirez in California for reasons that are complicated and I won't go into, but also fascinating. And her boyfriend gave her the drawing and said, I did this and I want you to have it. <laughs> and she kept the drawing for the next 40 years until to, it got to the point where she realized that she wanted to sell it, but she didn't want to sell it. So she put a ridiculously high price on it, thinking no one would buy it. And one of the first people who walked into the gallery was someone who had seen the show in Mexico City. And that picture is still in the living room of my friend's house, right, in Brooklyn. Uh, so for me, it was a tremendously visceral moment to see that single piece, recognizing it, knowing how important it was, and to connect with the work on both on a personal level, but thinking about it uh, symbolically, thinking about Ramirez as a symbol maker, thinking about someone who was actually very conscious about the work that he was doing. And that leads me directly to the Ramirez problem. And this is what I want Victor to talk a little bit about. And that is Victor mentioned the myth of Martin Ramirez. And let me, uh, so I'll recite that very quickly. 
The myth about Martin Ramirez, this is what I knew, this is what Frank heard, this is what we all knew at the time, was he was a deaf mute, he was uh, absolutely isolated, he spoke to no one, he had no understanding about the work that he was doing, he was a kind of savant, he was institutionalized, and that the work on some level had no meaning, it was utterly personal, it referred only to itself, and that it was a kind of species of, or almost like a symptom of mental disease, a remarkable symptom, but a kind of very specialized artistic product nonetheless. And I wanna read you a quote, and this is, this is the kind of thinking, there was a lot of pushback against Ramirez as an artist. And this came up when I was reading through my stuff last night. This is what the, the critic Donald Cuspit, who's a, a remarkably, he's a controversial critic and also a, an impressive thinker. This is what he said about Ramirez's work, okay? The point is, great art is hypocritical. It elaborates a language both in it for itself, on the one hand, and also in order to communicate in however cunning a way. It demonstrates a complex conscious control even over the unconscious conflicts that fuel it. Ramirez's work doesn't show such control. And there is nothing more to mine than what is on the surface. No last ounce of artistic or emotional meaning is to be exacted. That's Donald Cuspit, a, an a absolutely enormous art forum critic, a kind of figure. This is his take on Ramirez. And it fits into the myth, and that's what I want, or that's what I hope that uh, Victor can tell us a little bit about how you dismantled that myth. Who is Martin Ramirez? Who was Martin Ramirez? Says a lot about critics. Says a lot about critics. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. But before before I start, I, I, I love the story you just told us about the, your friend and the drawing and... <laughs> It's so beautiful. Uh, and this can tell us a lot about that many, there are many, many drawings around, uh, around many different places in the United States that people were uh, taking from Ramirez when he was at the hospital. And so, yeah, I, I cite uh, Donald Cuspin in my, in my book and the quote that you read by him is exactly what, uh, when I started just reading some uh, people writing about Ramirez, that quote was one of the ones who pushed me to really to really work really hard to dismantle that idea. Uh, he, of course, he talked, for example, about not having that control and that meaning. I think those are, those are the, most, the, the most important element that we have to dismantle with some research. Because we, you, you, you see the Ramirez art and you see exactly the opposite. You see a lot of control. And in order to understand, understand the meaning, you have, we, have to go, we have to go back to the biography. Even some people don't like the idea about the biography. I think we, if we want to talk about Ramirez's meaning uh, in his art, we have to go, we have to start tracking who made this art, uh, try to guess with the research we, we did, what kind of motivations he had when he was producing his art. And most important for us is right now is what he was trying to communicate. Because at the end, he, just the me that was built about Ramirez was basically, we, Ramirez was not mute. We were, we were the ones who were responsible for him to be mute because we, we denied that there were any meaning in his art. So you know what I mean? So he was that mute. He was mute for us because we were, we were making him mute because he was able to communicate with us. Right, he wasn't mute, he's just not talking to us. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and we, you know, we didn't answer what he was trying to say because, because I, I, let's go back to the 1950s when Pablo Pasto, was at, uh, spending a lot of time with him. Yeah, can and, you tell us, Victor, tell us a little bit about who Tarmo Pasto well, was, since okay, some of us so don't hey, know. Hey, Guy, can I interject one thing? Yeah, yeah. Before, yeah go ahead, Frank. before we get into that with regard, yeah. to, with regard to critics, and I think it's important to say that, um, so you read the Donald Cuspid um, uh, critical review, and that, that's sort of one side of the coin. And then uh, years later, um, the critic, Roberta Smith, the the, uh, uh, the co-chief critic uh, of uh, the New York Times 
And when the Museum of American Folk Art did its first one of two Ramirez shows and Roberta Smith did a full page New York Times review of that show. And the very last line in Roberta Smith's uh, review, certainly one of the most, Roberta is one of the most important uh, art critics in the world today uh, about Ramirez. The last line was simply one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. So needed to say that. Yeah, yeah, I, I love uh, Roberta Smith's work. I think he, uh, her essay for the El Salon House Exhibition in the 1980s was the most beautiful piece I, I have I read about Ramirez. Uh, of course, there are many things I don't agree with because she didn't have too much information, but formally speaking, I think uh, she made a really powerful analysis of Ramirez's art. Um, and I love, I love her, her essay that, that she published in the 1980s. So, but look, going back to the meat, um, so you mentioned a couple of things, yeah, that he was mute. Uh, so the way I explain this when uh, when somebody asked me, I, I use the this idea about the telephone game. When you tell somebody something and this person tells the same idea to somebody else and then tell to somebody else, when you try to connect the, 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 main, the first idea and then after passing to two, uh, five, seven different people uh, in this telephone game, uh, at the end, at the end, uh, it became very highly distortion the, the, the idea that when you start. So what I basically did in my research is let me track back where this information is coming from. Where the information that most of the people were used in the 1980s, when I late 1980s, early 2000, when I started doing my research, where this information is coming from. And of course, it was coming from Florentano Pasto. So who's Tarno Pasto? Tarno Pas Pasto was a professor at Sacramento State College who uh, met Ramirez in, in late 1940s, and then start providing him with some materials, and he started collecting Ramirez's work to use in his classes. He was a psychologist, but he also was an artist. And then, but he didn't teach art in Sacramento. He was teaching psychology. But he liked to use art uh, with, his, with his students to discuss things about uh, a mental illness. So uh, one of the first myths, Tano Pasto used Ramirez art just for his class at the beginning. He was not the one who introduced Ramirez work into the art world. Ramirez art was introduced by a volunteer from the Red Cross who had a very strong connection with the art community in Sacramento. Her husband was the working at the most important art gallery in Sacramento that is now a museum. And so she is the one who introduced Ramirez Har to the curator and to her husband at the, uh, at the gallery, and they were the ones who organized the first Ramirez exhibition. And Tano Pasto came late into the project because they learned that Tano Pasto was visiting the Ramirez at the hospital. This is one of the myths that for many years circulated that Tano Pasto was the one who introduced Ramirez to that world. It's not like that. Uh, but okay, but but he was responsible in trying to spread information about Ramirez, because at some point he became the one who started leading Ramirez work in the 1950s. He took control of most, most of Ramirez art, and then he tried to organize a couple of exhibitions in California and the West Coast and also in the East Coast with being only successful in uh, in Syracuse. Uh, he organized one of, one of the more exhibitions at Berkeley and then organized the exhibition in, in Syracuse. Uh, so, but the point is that he is the one who made the first biography. But my research indicates that he didn't have access to the to Ramirez file. So, because it was uh, confidential information. So he was not able to get any information from, from the hospital. So he basically built his own story about Ramirez. He also stayed many times that it was impossible to have a communication with him. Something that my research found that it was not like that. Tamo Pasto didn't speak Spanish. Uh, <laughs> so I was able to find people who communicate with, in Spanish with Ramirez first, so the priest. You're saying that the reason that there was the reputation that, or the myth that Ramirez was mute was because no one bothered to speak to him in his language. Yeah, at least, at least not the in one- In part, who, yeah. at least in part. Yeah, at least because the, the Tamo Pasto who was, uh, having contact with Ramirez very frequently, he didn't engage in any conversation with him. And he was not interested in having that conversation yeah. because he, he, he didn't want to, you know, his approach was, 
they speak, they are speak by itself psychologically. He was mm -hmm. looking for a for a very a very per, a, a perfect case to study psychotic art. And Ramirez became the perfect example for that. So he was not interested in talking with him because he only wanted to use his art as a tool to understand uh, psychotic issues. So he was looking for a perfect psychotic, a uh, case of extreme schizophrenia who was producing a lot of art and Ramirez was the perfect case. But how well, did Ramirez come into the institution in the first place? I mean, his biography is so moving and it's so compelling. Um, I wonder if you could give us a little background on just how he wound up at DeWitt State Hospital in the first place. Okay, yeah, he, he uh, 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 the first institution was in, in, in Stockton. And from Stockton, he was transferred to the Right. He was, he was uh, institutionalized in 1931, in the middle of the Great Depression. Uh, the, the, the only information we have about that came from the reports from the police uh, that are included in the Ramirez file. So he was detained in Stockton. It seems that in, in, in really bad physical conditions and not emotionally stable. And he was detained by the police. And then he, 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 he said he was sent directly to the, to the Stockton. What is, what is illegal? In those years, you have to detain somebody. The police have to detain somebody that was somebody argued that had mental issues. So the police go detain the person and put the person in a, in a special detention center then the, the, the city sends a psychologist to the detention center to check that it's really true that he is, the person is having some psychological issues and then have to go to, in front of a, 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 a judge and then is committed to an institution. And the, and the first time they, they basically escape all those steps and Ramirez was, uh, was taken from the streets to the streets in Stockton uh, and sent directly to the Stockton State Hospital. Right. Uh, and, what, yeah. And he came up from Mexico. Originally, he came up from Mexico to work. And the reason I, I press the biographical details is because so much of this information about him actually shows up in the work itself. And the kinds of images that, that have moved many of us, the ones that are almost iconic, are very much related to the place he came from, the things he was thinking about, and his relationship to his, to his home country. Uh, and I, so I think if, if we can even go back a little further, can you tell us about where Ramirez came from, what kind of experiences he had before he came to the United States? Because I think those are enormously moving. Okay, so uh, we, we, we need to know that in, uh, in the history of migration between Mexico and the United States, in the 19, 1920s, when Ramirez left his small town, 1925, it was a large, a massive migration from Mexico to the United States. He was not the only one. Many people in his small town, uh, his, his small ranch, or we call it Mexico's rancherias. And we have to be careful here because there's all this kind of confusion. Some people, when we say that Ramirez had a ranch and then he tried to the States, we have to be careful because when we, when, in the United States term, with ranch is a very large property. Ramirez was a, a ranchero that in Mexico means uh, the owner of a really, really small rural property. We're talking about only, uh, 20 hectares. I don't, I don't know what the size for. Uh, for in, yeah, it's uh, quite state. small. Yeah, it's very small uh, with a little house made uh, with very rudiment, rudimentary stones and things like that. It's not a ranch in the same way we, we imagine it. It's a very, it's very, it's a very teeny, teeny small property. So then he came to the States in order to pay for the debt for buying this piece of land and, of course, to use resources to, to work his land with his family. Uh, many people in his small town and his small ranch, they were doing something like that. So yeah, he used his wife in Edwards to go to work in California. He worked in the rival industry and in the mines. And he was there in the 1920s when his family told not to get back to Mexico. We assume that he was planning just to be there in, in California for a couple of years, years to save some money. But when he was in California, a civil war started in his land. In his homeland, that uh, in Mexico is called the Cristero Rebellion. It was uh, a very, a very bloody, <laughs> horrible conflict between the state and and some people and followers of the Catholic Church in Mexico. And Ramirez land, his Ramirez uh, area, was the center of the conflict. 
So basically, it was uh, the, the federal army came into the area and took control of the land. So people that were in the states, uh, the relatives told them to stay, especially because it was difficult to go back and, and not get involved into the war, but also because the money, because now they needed more the resources from the United States, the remittances to survive. So Ramirez had to stay in California. But, and then he started receiving very contradictory information about his family. And one of the information he got from his family is that his wife had joined the federal army to fight against the local people. And that something can be very difficult to understand for somebody like Ramirez. So this information is coming from Ramirez's family. And they, they believe that this wrong information put him in a really difficult emotional state. And also when he was in California, his only son was born with the, when he was absent. Uh, uh, so I, I imagine that he maybe had also doubts about the paternity of, of the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, this story, this part of the story has been, well, I, I want to talk about the image that's up on screen and, and get you both to comment on it, because I, I think it's a, how should we say, it's a gateway into the work that's really, really compelling. But uh, reading through your the, the essay, your kind of trial run for the book that you published a few years ago in the catalog, I think it was for the, the Folk Art Museum in, in New York, uh, it, it was tremendously moving to think about this man who was a, would work the land, uh, who is deeply connected to the physical geography of a place, who comes up north, gives up all his connections, goes to work in enormously difficult circumstances, and then runs in, into an economic depression after he's found out or thinks he's found out that his wife has gone over to the other side and is fighting, literally fighting, for the federales. And that sense of total dislocation and betrayal uh, is, is just enormously powerful. And thinking about that, it gets back to images like this. And I know you've written about it. Frank's thought about pictures like this. This picture that Ramirez goes back to over and over again of a, of a jinete or a, a caballero um, on a horse, often with, with a gun. Um, the sort of thing that was dismissed as sort of obsessive because he keeps going back to it. Uh, and that was the kind of blanket term that was used continuously or constantly when I was first reading about Ramirez's work, that it was all obsessive. Um, well, it would be obsessive if this was your whole world. Mm -hmm. And so I want to know how you read, because we don't have Ramirez's thoughts about what every picture means. Clearly, these are symbolic presentations for him. They're not just obsessive, crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. He's trying to communicate something. That's obvious. And I just saw in the chat, and I don't want to monopolize this, but I just saw in the chat, uh, one of our regular visitors um, to the to rail conversations has asked a really interesting question. And what he asked was, could you talk a little about how Wayne Thiebaud, the, the painter, the artist, who met Ramirez, as you've written, who met Ramirez at the hospital because he was you know, on the West Coast and he was very interested in, you know, around Sacramento and in, in these presentations of work that was being done inside the prison. He went to see Ramirez's work. Not only did he write about it and say that he, he loved it, but he asked Ramirez directly what he was looking at. He said, is this a shoe? And Ramirez said, yes, it's a shoe. But Thibault asked him in Spanish. Yeah. And clearly Ramirez understood. Uh, he knew what he was doing. I mean, it, and it should be obvious to anybody who's ever looked at a piece of art that this is not just casual work, nor is it yeah. the product of mental illness. So if we can talk about the horseman for a minute, I wonder if you talk a little bit about that as a symbol for Ramirez and how you read those pictures. And then I, I want to ask Frank another question about this as well. Okay, so yeah, yes, 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 yes. To be to be clear, uh, we are those are just hypotheses. We really don't know <laughs> what Ramirez was thinking because right, nobody had the Gwen Thibault had very short conversation with him, but right. he didn't very go very short. deep into the meaning of his art. He was more interested in the way he represented things. Oh, this is a right. shoe. Yes, a shoe. So he was trying to figure out what he was 
to represent them, but he didn't go deep in what is the larger meaning of the work. So yes, I, I just only, only have to be say that those are hypotheses because we, are, we cannot be in cyber and medicine mind. But if we connect the information we have about him now more precise about Mexico and the time he left, uh, we know we have a little bit more information to speculate, to speculate about the possible meaning of that. And of course, it can be something literal meaning, and it can be something more like a symbolic meaning. And also, we need to, uh, something I, I try to explain in my book is when we think, when we talk about sources, what are the visual sources for Ramirez? We have to be careful and distinguish visual sources with memory sources. Memory sources are maybe the things that he's thinking about it from his memories back in his homeland, but visual sources can be something very different. He can open a magazine and inside the, the institution, he can open a magazine, saw a picture of a cowboy, and maybe the cowboy uh, can be used as a, uh, as a model to, to his drawing. That can be the visual source. But he's thinking about his own memories. He's, he's being referred to something that happened to him. So we have to be careful with those two different sources because there's a lot of confusion <clears throat> about. I think you're. So, uh, oh no! Uh, yeah. Uh, so sorry, least, Victor, sorry, Victor. I was uh, I was just going to agree with you and and say it's something that I've thought about often. And you're and you're really absolutely right in your analysis. Um, I like to call it sort of um, long memory, you know, meaning older memory uh, and and recent memory. And when you look at something like uh, the, the Caballeros, clearly that was uh, something uh, that would, the revolution uh, was a very significant, maybe the most significant event uh, in, in his life. And um, the Caballero that's on the screen now and many other imagery, many other, many other, um, um, uh, many other uh, works that depict various characters are uh, Ramirez has placed them on a stage, on a on a presidium, and I think that that I've always thought that that was particularly significant, um, almost like almost like a bullseye. He's really uh, he's he's really focusing our attention on that particular subject that he wants to that he wants to feature. Um, also, when we, look at it, when we look at a show like Memory Portals, obviously um, we've used the word memory in there for, for a very real reason. And uh, the Memory Portals are primarily works that are abstracted. In other words, they're, uh, they're not figurative works. And I, I often say to myself, you know, where, where in the world did it, where in the world did this imagery come from? Um, it's, it's kind of the, it's kind of the essence of, of creativity. It's a question that I've really never been able to, to answer properly, other than to say that um, Ramirez was born with, with a gift. How that gift developed through circumstances uh, is, a, is a whole nother story. But um, it's something, what Ramirez did is not something that you can learn in art school. It just, it, it just absolutely cannot be taught. However it, it happened, that is the essence of, of creativity. That is the essence of a master. And Ramirez was absolutely a master. So he took um, old memories and he took new memories. And when I look at the memory portal show that we have up now, a lot of people reference um, uh, mines, they reference um, uh, train tunnels, that sort of thing. And I think that that is definitely part of part of the whole thing. But when I look at the show that we have up now and I look at photographs um, of DeWitt State Hospital and I look, at, I look at the courtyard and I look at the buildings surrounding the courtyard and I look at all of 
the windows and I look at the doors. And when I'm in the gallery, I very much see DeWitt State Hospital there. And I think that that is a recent memory thing for Ramirez. Um, and as you said, Lyle, um, all of the works in the memory portal show are what we refer to as the last works. So um, we don't know exactly how it might have happened, but clearly uh, whether Ramirez was looking through a window at a uh, facade facing him uh, or whether he was actually in the courtyard, we were not there. We don't, we don't really know, but I think that is where a lot of it comes from. Yeah, I, I, I want to respond a little bit to things that you, and with more questions. Um, as long as we're, we're on the subject of late work, um, I, I wonder, I, I'd like to get Victor thinking about this as well. Clearly the work that most people know and that is most familiar are those works where there are two things going on. One, where there are iconic references like the deer, the the horsemen, and these are all animals or, or people in niches. Those are very well known. And the train tunnels. Victor has written about the fact that, that Ramirez worked in the, uh, on the railroad and worked for the railroad uh, when he came north. Clearly, that's going to be an enormously important experience for me, him looking at the work. But as, and, and again, I don't know exactly physically what was happening to him. Uh, in the institution, um, and, and you, I think Victor can clarify this, but it, it's very clear that the work becomes more, based on these drawings, the work becomes more schematic. Uh, the line becomes even more pronounced and the organization of the pictures becomes uh, repetitive and in a, in a really interesting way. I, I love Frank's insight that this might be very much connected to the institution itself. I had some other ideas about that, but, but I think to be in the presence of the work and to see the length and the, the perfect repetition of forms, that clearly things are changing for the artist. And I'd love to get Victor's take on just your sense of sort of whether there was a transition. Obviously, he didn't abandon all, all the themes that he was committed to. But stylistically, he becomes much more pronounced in the way he deals with stuff. And I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Uh, whenever I see that in any artist, I'm always interested in kind of what that represents. A change in their attitude toward the world, toward their work, toward the kinds of things they were trying to communicate. I'm, I'm wondering how you react to that, Victor. Yeah, I think that the, this exhibition is, is the perfect background for this conversation. because. Uh, in, the, in those drawings, Ramirez, um, the most figurative elements are not present. The most classical ones, like the horse, the deer. In some, in some of the drawings in, the, in this series, the train is part of the, part of right. the division because the train is mostly, mostly lines that melted perfectly with the designs. So when you see works like this, it's difficult to identify if the, if the artist was have some training or not. When you see a horse, you can easily identify that the person who did the drawing didn't have too much training in the way a horse has to be depicted. So the uh, same happens with uh, uh, Joseph Joachim. When you see the exactly. landscapes, yep. but, and then when you see the little houses and the little trees, there is a big contrast because if you delete all the all the all the rep, uh, representative elements in Joseph Joachim art, and you just leave leave the, the landscape. You, you you cannot get that somebody with a dream did something like that. It's only when you start looking the way he draw little trees and in a very more representative way when you see the person who did this didn't have any formal training. Same with Ramirez. If you remove the horses, the, the Maybe the deers is, is a little more complicated because he worked a lot in the deers, and some of the deers are really extremely sophisticated the way he, the way he did it. But not not all the time. There are a couple of deers that are more. Um, I don't want to use the word simplistic, but are more more. Um, you can easily identify that the person who did that drawing had, had any training. 
But in the, in the current exhibition, it's difficult to do something like that because the representative elements are not here. Mm -hmm. So this, this exhibition is just really, really impressive. And talking about this about form, and Ramirez, Ramirez played with lines all, all his career. Uh, uh, there are very early versions of those drawings in Ramirez's collection. Uh, there are small and seems like they were sketches that he was later planning to integrate into the drawing. So he had many, many drawings where there were only lines. The people who saw him paint, uh, working, he believed that those were the sketches that he was going to integrate in composition that had, had some figurative elements. So yeah, there are examples of this very early in his, in his, in his trajectory. So I don't believe that this is the, this is something that a change in the style. What I believe this is again an hypothesis is that over the time Ramirez became more, you know, he was he was drawing every single day for many years, right? And he was working and repeating the same topics. I, I don't want to say that he got tired about those, but I want to say that at the, at the end of his life, he just basically concentrated and did something that for him it was implies more freedom. If you move from figurative to abstract or more linear works, there's some kind of liberations in doing that because you are not forced to represent anything. Let me give you an example. Yeah. Let me give an example. I am being following the work of Julia Sisi. And Julia Sisi went from being more figurative into became more and more abstract. Julia Sisi has drawn most of her life faces. But her, you look at the first faces that a couple many years ago you saw that it was a face. And now the more current work is mostly abstract. It's forcing wow. those faces into something more, less figurative. And this is something very liberating. You are an artist. This moving away from the figurative things gave, gave you more room, more freedom for expression. And maybe this is what happened with Ramirez over the years. At the end, he focused more on those pieces because maybe, those those were even more therapeutic for him. Yes, I, I, I and and I'm I'm curious to get Frank's take on this as well, since you've been looking at this work for, as you say, 15 years. Um, physically, it's possible that you know that this was simply it was easier to do. The forms were easier to manage, as you imply. So. If his health was not good, it clearly wasn't. This may have been, let's call it a fallback position, which is super intriguing to me, that kind of fundamentally, at the basis, he was an abstract artist, okay? Um, not exactly, but, but profoundly. That's one part of it. But the other thing that you're saying, that, that it's a set of choices that are, that are very much aesthetic. In other words, what is it that he feels drawn to at, toward the end of his life? And obviously he doesn't necessarily know it's the end of his life, but this is clearly what he was drawn to. These are the forms that became super important to him. And it, it just struck me in looking at the work, the last time I was in the, in the gallery to see this work, I, you know, when I first saw this, again, this is 10 years ago now or something like that, I, I just didn't understand it at all. I mean, yes, I knew it was Ramirez. Yes, I understood the formal characteristics made it clear, but there was something about it that I just, it was so strange to me not to see the iconic representations. And now, you know, having seen it again, I'm, I'm absolutely mesmerized by the fact that this was the place that he gravitated to these kinds of basic forms repeated. And again, I don't know what he was thinking, as you say, but I, the, to me, I found this, I mean, really enormously moving again, um, as much as I, I'm entranced by the earlier work and I think it's really important. There's something about the, the basic character of this and not to push this too far, because I'm always suspicious of easy connections between insider artists and people who don't have any connection with the art world. But there are things that happen to artists kind of when they get older or when they're dealing with certain kinds of physical issues. And I kept thinking about Willem de Kooning at the end of his life and the kinds of pictures that he was doing when he was suffering from Alzheimer's and how, again, these are kind of controversial works, but he moves toward things that are really essential. 
certain aspects of line. That's all he does. It's, it's not none of the Sturm and Drang of the earlier work, but an incredible concentration on one thing. And I, again, as I said before, I found this enormously moving to see this. Yeah, and when we talk about meaning, maybe the most powerful meaning and more sophisticated meaning is in those drawings, because those drawings are telling us about something, about the emotions of somebody being far away from his family. He finally was very close to die. He knew that he wasn't going to see anybody else again. And then uh, the meaning can be even more deep in those pieces because they can, lead, they can be connected with emotions about life, about death, about things that are more sophisticated, just, just this obsession of the horses and the war in Mexico and why my way betray me and things like that. When you are just at this time in your life, when you know that you're going to die there, then you maybe start making something like this, that with these tunnels that are dark, semi-dark and you really don't know where you're going to be next when after you die and Ramirez was a religious man so something we we have not to forget about it yes exactly uh Frank I'm really interested you know you've been looking at this work I mean obviously the 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 family and again Victor's work in bringing together uh the family connection to Ramirez to his to to his his extended family. Um, you've had a lot of contact with them. You've been looking at this work for a long time. I, I'd really like to hear how, how you live with this. How do you feel about it? What do you see here? Well, you know, I, th I think um, what both with both of you have already said is um, to me, it, his last works are really a distillation of his early works. Um, Lyle, you mentioned that, you know, he could have been, uh, his health might not have been great. And I think to a certain extent, uh, that's true, but I don't think that it affected, uh, his output in terms of, uh, the physicality of the drawings. Uh, you got to remember that he produced his largest works, uh, toward the end of his life. Right. Exactly. Uh, the, lar the largest work that, that he produced. Uh, that he pieced together, uh, it, that was shown at Reina Sofia, uh, is 22 feet long, 22 feet long. And if you, if you look at the work on the screen right now, uh, it, happens to be, it happens to be one of my favorite, one of my favorite works. Uh, I kind of call it the Rothko Ramirez. <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> the Rothko Chapel here, right? And if it's hard to see on the screen, but I have the work hanging in the gallery and I look at I look at it all the time. And you look at each one of these portals, you look at each one of these graduated portals, and you look at the and you look at the marks, the graphite marks. And the graphite marks are so beautiful. They're so sophisticated they're so complete they're repetitious but the whole thing is is really so on on purpose um to me there is there is nothing in in terms of uh, well gee i'm you know lazy so i'm gonna do the same thing over and over again the whole thing uh, is is really um very deliberate and it's and it's funny, Lyle, that uh, you should mention de Kooning because um, as you were speaking and as Victor was speaking, uh, what I was thinking about really was de Kooning's last works. And you also said, Lyle, that uh, when you first came across the last works, and I remember when you first came across the last works and, and your reaction, you were, you were very polite, of course, um, but I could tell that they didn't exactly resonate with you in the same way that the earlier works, the more figurative works, resonated with you. And your reaction is the same reaction that I've had for 15 years. So as soon as 
we show a figurative work, whether it's a deer, whether it's a horse, whether it's a rabbit, whether it's a Madonna, uh, those are the works that, at least in the beginning, everyone gravitated toward, the works that everyone wanted, works that everyone bought. I don't have a single one of those in the gallery, but I do have these very, I do have this show now, which is a show that's, that's doing well, but it's taken 15 years before people have come to the abstracted works, that have come to the last works, that have, that have come to, um, that, have, that have come to this show. And in, in, in the same way, the same thing happened with the last works of, of de Kooning. Um, yes, de Kooning had, and, de Kooning had know, Alzheimer's, for, yes, for but, sure. But, but. But de Kooning was, was a consummate painter. De, de Kooning had um, a muscle memory language uh, that, that was really in, incredible. And even though it may have, uh, Alzheimer's may have somewhat clouded uh, that vision, still the essence of who de Kooning was still, still existed. But when de Kooning started producing those late works, people started saying, a lot of people said, oh, gee, you know, oh, they're, they're not very good. Well, de Kooning had Alzheimer's. He didn't know what he was doing. They're just sort of, and now our perception of those works really very different, very much of a distillation of de Kooning's earlier works. Well, I've gotten older, I can tell you that. And as I've gotten older, things change. Um, uh, you know, we could talk about Beethoven's late quartets. He was deaf, okay? So it's not like this is an unusual phenomenon. Going into a situation where things become much more abstract, uh, we might even say rarefied. One of the people who has been commenting on this had just reiterated this idea that Victor was talking about, that the, and, and that Frank has titled the show, that these are portals. That is, these are places to enter. They're dark inside which is very, very different for Ramirez. There's nothing in there. They could very well be funer funeral niches, you know, not to push the interpretation too hard, but they have, to, my, to me, just a tremendously um, meditative presence. I mean, I, I feel like we're in the presence of last things. Uh, and again, I don't want to push that, you know, the fact that, we're not as young as we used to be, but things talk to us in a different way as we get older. And uh, are these empty catacombs? I don't know. But I feel like there's an encroaching darkness here that, that we have to come to terms with. The artist is offering us a way to do that. What's inside? Not clear. Uh, I wanted to ask another question, and, and this will take us back uh, to earlier work. Uh, I don't have the... Um, I don't have the images in front of me right now, but we can find one. I, I wanted to talk a little bit, I want you guys to talk a little bit about the collage aesthetic, okay? Um, and we, we've have, I have to see if I can pull up the, just on my, I'll you tell can, you which image. You I'm can thinking. pull up Lyle, the, uh, the, Caval the Cavaliero with the trains. The, yeah. With the that, cars, that's, right. Uh, that's brilliant use of collage. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, not that one. Let's see. Do, do we know which one? Ah, here, I think yeah. that, yeah. Um, no, there's another one. Let me, let me see if I can find it. Ah, oh, yeah, right. Uh, this is slide 26. Oh yeah, there it is. You're up. Sorry. My bad. Um, Ramirez has sources and, and it's very intriguing. As, as the scholarship is done on, and at the same time, I urge everyone to go see the Joseph Yoakum exhibition at the uh, at, at MoMA right now. It's enormously important. Uh, the work is absolutely mind-bending, beautiful. Um, it's loaded with challenges for us, things to think about vis-a-vis -vis how we relate to the natural world. Um, so go see it. Some similar issues in the career of Yoakum, and interestingly, Yoakum, and 
and Ramirez were championed by the same artist, Jim Nutt. Um, he, he, he always seemed to be in the right place at the right time, making the right choices as an artist about what he wanted to look at. Ramirez, Yoakum. And so anyway, go, it's, it's just an admonishment to, to go to, to MoMA and see that show. But um, they, ha they have sources. And one of the things that's really important about what Victor's done is that if you take them seriously as artists, you do exactly what you would do if you're going to think about the work of any artist, which is you're going to try to understand what their inspirations were, what they borrowed, what they, what they used, what they cribbed, what they stole, and how they transformed them. And I'm really, I think Ramirez is an absolute textbook case in how he made very specific choices about the things he stole. And I'm thinking about his collage aesthetic. And I wonder if, if both of you would talk a little bit about just how collage worked for this artist. We don't have a whole bunch of examples, but we got a few, and this is a pretty good one. Um, this is a pretty amazing one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Really, I think it's, it, it's, it's always been um, my favorite use of collage, at least in terms of, in terms of Ramirez. And uh, I, I look at it and I, I, I almost just can't, can't believe it. So um, here, you here you have, in the upper part of the picture, you have this caballero that is um, framed against a window, a window of darkness. And then for Ramirez to take these uh, general motor cars and cut them out of a magazine, as I'm, as I'm sure he did, maybe from magazines lying around a waiting room or one of the doctors, who knows. Um, and to juxtapose a life that he knew um, on the ranch or the <laughs> light or the revolution. And then the lower half of the picture, uh, you have these brand new model General Motor cars. Um, not only that, then he's, he's taken these almost sort of psychedelic portion <laughs> of, uh, of archways and, and tunnels. And he's covered the cars with these, with these tunnels. Uh, it just, you know, every, every time I look at this picture, it just, uh, it's a degree of sophistication that just absolutely drives me crazy. And it's also really funny. I mean, the, the association of horses and cars is like, it's perfect anyway. Uh, what he was thinking exactly, I don't know, but it's just such a, a wonderful association. Uh, Victor, you know, I, I wanted to ask you, but obviously I wish we had more time to talk in detail about Ramirez's choices. And um, I, I wonder if you could talk about how he uses other people's pictures, that is usually photographs. Yeah, uh, let me tell you, this is the, uh, the collages were the most fascinating part of my research because we, first I have to find the sources, where those images are coming from, exactly what kind of magazines. And then I have to run in um, secondhand stores and get the orig originals to see how many pages were there and why he selected this piece from this specific magazine that include many different things. So I was able to identify the issues, the edition where he had all those images. This, it was a really fun part of my research and very challenging too. And I want to tell you something very, very important here. Jim Nad, he, he has a, an amazing eye for art. Uh, it's not a coincidence here. He became in contact with Joseph Joachim and that he ended up um, acquiring all the Ramirez works. And also very, very important, when they divide the war between him and his skin, you look to, to, to the two different collections, the ones who belong to Jim Nutt and the one who belong to Philip Skine, you are going to see that Jim Nutt selected for him all the collages. Most ah. of the collages went to Jim Nutt part because he, he was the one, I think Philip Skine gave him the chance to pick up whatever he wanted because Jim Nutt was the one who found the drawings in California and they got the, the drawings together. So Phyllis, uh, Jim Nutt had the chance to pick up whatever he wanted before sending the other half to, to, to Chicago. So uh, Jim Nutt, he's intentionally selected all the collages. 
Jimna was fascinated by that because he was amazed by the way Ramirez was working. And the collages was telling a lot about the techniques what he was using, the sources, the way he manipulated all those images. So when you think about the, the, the collage, you have to see the images integrated into Ramirez are in two different ways. One is when he uses the image to integrate the image into the drawing. Right. In this case, he's drawing over the image. He's using just the paper as a background to trace his lines. And we can speculate, maybe because he wanted to add a second part to the drawing and he didn't have paper. So he got this piece from the magazine and just glued the piece onto the paper. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Frank is, is right. When, when he did something like that, that was intentional, I think he was fascinated by this idea. This is why the collage has also more colors. The lines have more colors over the color. So, but the, the, a different ways when he, when he integrates the, 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 the cuts from the magazine into the composition. And you're going to see many like that. And some are just fascinating. So, 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 so one more point here, uh, the access to magazines. Something I found in my research is that he had a plenty access to publications. Why? Because the institution went to the community and asked for donations. So every, every house in the area that was having a subscription to X magazine, they sent those to the weed for free. And they gave to, to all those protests to, to, to the weed. And then the rest, Red Cross ladies, they, was, they, they were, they were the, the ones in charge of making the distribution of those, of those magazines into all the different wards. And somebody I interviewed, I used to work at the WIT, she told me, we didn't care about the, about the magazine. We didn't care if they destroyed the magazine deficiency because we have many, we have plenty. We receive donations every single month. So we let the patients to do whatever they wanted with the publication. So Ramirez had a plenty access to publications and he was free to cut, to, 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 to glue the way he wanted. The most interesting part here is when you have the edition that he was having in his hands and you go over the magazine and you found you find what pages he was more interested in and what others not. This is what becomes really fascinating. All, all the control he had about the shoes, the, the decisions he was making when he was making his art. It's another more evidence of the control he had sobre what he was doing. Also, Victor, with, 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 re, with regard to... Uh, control and with regard, it's not exactly collage, but it's something that has always fascinated me. Um, Ramirez was a smoker um, <laughs> within the hospital, mm -hmm. yeah. and Ramirez rolled his own rolled his own cigarettes. So he always had, you wouldn't think, but had access clearly to matches and rolling paper and and tobacco. And uh, early on, when I looked at, at the work of Ramirez, and I would look at these sort of bright areas um, of a particular work, and I'd say to myself, gee, you know, how did, how did he create that? At first, I thought it was some kind of a, some kind of a white paint that he used. Uh, I just didn't know. And then when I really looked closely at it, I could see that uh, it was rolling paper. And he actually he used <laughs> he used rolling paper, basically as sort of whiteout or uh, as highlighter. And he'd rip it, he would chew it, he would attach it, <laughs> uh, he would attach it to the drawings. So in the same way that he did that, um, he was sometimes using collage in in that fashion. Yeah, it's um, fascinating. Yeah, I, 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 we're, I, I think we, we need to allow just a little bit of time, A, for a poem and B, for um, maybe a few questions. But it, it's a great place to, to end in a way because it says something about the making of work or the making of art. Um, and that is, I would kind of reduce it to the idea of whatever it takes. And I think the collage aesthetic is very much part of that. Whatever it takes to make the picture you want to make doesn't matter where it comes from, doesn't matter anything, as long as it looks the way you want it to look. And as long as you can make it look the way you want it to look, communicate what you want to communicate. And that's one of the things I find so wonderful about this work and also so moving. Uh, we can feel how much effort was involved to get it right, to get it the way he wanted. And um, I mean, for me, that's a, that's a great place to, for us to 
to leave off and and to keep in mind uh, when we when we have a chance to look at the work. So again, I would urge everyone to go see the work at Rico Moresca um, and make your own judgments. Um, anyway, I appreciate the contributions of Frank and Victor. It's just great to have you both in to talk about stuff that we love. Lyle, and, I have to, I, I, excuse me, I, I have to say one, one last sure, thing. Sure, go Frank. Before the, before the questions. Yeah. And that is, uh, we talked a lot about uh, loneliness and we talked about the work and we talked about Ramirez, um, the time that he spent uh, in the hospital and being picked up uh, by the police. And uh, I hear over and over again, uh, people say to me, oh, that's such a sad story. That's such a sad story. Yes, there are certain aspects um, of it that are sad. But uh, as a teacher once said to me a very long time ago, uh, he said to me, you're dead a lot longer than you're alive with regard to art. <laughs> and, and so Ramirez crossed the Rio Grande uh, looking, looking for work, I think hoping to send money back to Mexico. Well, that, that, ne that never happened. And so the circumstances of his life, his, hosp his hospitalization. But the point is that uh, in his death, uh, he has achieved a degree of fame that 99 and 44 one hundredths percent of the artists in the world only dream about. The US Postal Service seven years, seven years ago did five Ramirez forever stamps. Quite a, uh, an absolutely remarkable thing. And in his death, he's doing, he is supporting the Ramirez family. Proceeds, uh, here we go. Um, the pro, most of the proceeds from the sales go to the, the Ramirez estate, the Ramirez family. So Ramirez is really doing exactly what he set out to do. It's just an amazing positive story. Thanks, Frank, that's, that's really wonderful. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, Lyle and Victor, um, for such a lovely conversation. We really appreciate you all, um, and you'll you'll now get to continue with our audience questions. Um, we're going to go first to a question from GE. GE, I know one of your questions got asked, but I believe you had two. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Ramirez has been so important to me for so long, and thank you, Ty, and everyone. Um, the second part of my question um, that, that I put up was, of course, we know that uh, Wayne Tubal uh, had, had a, a, a bit of a relationship with him and discovered the fact that he was using little models and things and, you know, and things like that. But I'm wondering, really, I, I was always so much taken by Wayne Tubal's, um his landscape work and was wondering if we, we know whether or not of course, Wayne is no longer with us. Whether or not uh, Ramirez had a had an impact on his work in his landscapes, because it also seems as though there's even some Arthur Dove kind of you know mm -hmm. feeling to some of these pieces too. Mm -hmm. So, can I go ahead with that question? Yeah, because I I, I I have been thinking about this for many many years. Yeah, yes, I believe that Ramirez impacted Wayne Thibault landscapes. Because if you see Ramirez with uh, landscapes, they, 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 they use exactly the, 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 the distortion of Ramirez perspective. And of course, uh, Pibo is, is, is having as a point of reference, those streets in San Francisco that go is going down, exactly. going up. But the, the important point here is that you, produce, you, you put one of the Ramirez landscapes and one of the Pibo landscapes is the same idea. And I have not write about this, but I am pretty sure it's all, all these speculations. So I am really happy that somebody made the same conclusion like me because Thibault was fascinated by Ramirez's work and he has to be impacted in some ways. You know, you're an artist, you can unconsciously sometimes follow something that you saw before. And I, I, I really believe, and I, this is one idea that maybe somebody needs to explore and a curator put together Wayne Thibault landscapes and Ramirez landscapes in an exhibition. I think something has something has some, somebody has to do this. 
especially because there are some Ramirez landscapes that according, according to me are highly impacted, maybe not impacted, let's see, let's say it in a different way. Ramirez, some of Ramirez landscapes can follow the tradition of the California landscape because right. the light, the colors of the landscapes in, in the California tradition are very similar to some of the Ramirez drawings, especially the ones that didn't include the stage. There are some Ramirez drawings where you, you, don't see, you don't see the stage, you don't see the traditional stage with the curtains, you just see just the landscape. Those for me are some of, some of my favorite Ramirez drawings. And let me show you one because I have one here. I think this is, this is Wayne Thibault. Okay, this is Wayne Thibault. <laughs> Okay, mm. this is one of my favorite Ramirez <laughs> This landscape doesn't have any stage. You see, I, I would like to see one day these Ramirez drawing hanging together in a museum or in a gallery with, with Thibault's uh, work and, and somebody making the connection. So, so thanks so much for bringing this topic. Oh, no, thank you. I wait for that day too. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, GE, for that question. And thank you, Victor, for your answer and for showing us your, your work there. Yeah, um, it's, not, it's not original, okay? It's a, it's a reproduction, <laughs> it's a small reproduction. <laughs> we, we love um, the, uh, the awareness that comes with the Zoom screen. So I appreciate yeah. that we got to see a little bit of your surroundings there. Um, we're going to go next to a question from Melissa. Uh, Melissa, I've passed you the mic now. You should be able to unmute at will. I'm gonna pass it one more time. You should be able to click that little button in the request there. Or I can ask it on your behalf as well. I may ask Melissa's question on their behalf. Um, Melissa asked, uh, wasn't Ramirez an accomplished horseman? And doesn't the horse figure prominently in the culture of his hometown? Right, I saw that question pop up. Uh, Victor, you, you've written a lot about this. Um, you could ride, you could ride. Yeah, he, 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 yeah, he, you know, he had a horse and he grew up in a small community where you, you, need, you need a horse to survive, to move around. And yeah, I was very lucky to interview somebody who used to work in Ramirez land when he was 15 years old. So when I went to the field, I still found alive this man. And he is the one who with this Ramirez riding the horse and being one of the best horse riders in the area. So yeah, he was, he, the drawings can uh, tell you that he had a lot of skills, but also he, he, had a, he had knowledge about the horse culture. You can see in the drawings that the, 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 he know about. It. Thank you for answering, um, Melissa, I hope that that answers your question all right. Um, we are actually going to go next to a question from uh, rail friend Tom McGlynn. Uh, Tom, I know you just re-entered the room. I'm passing you a mic now. I hope that's all right. We're having kind of an uh, unconventional Q&A today. <laughs> but you guys are rolling with the punches. Oh, here we go, Tom. I'm sorry, you know, I just, I got knocked off the meeting and I'm just coming back. Uh, so I, I assume you wanted me to ask the question. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, it may be, it may be a reach, but um, uh, aspects of the, the kind of schematic figuration and the figurative aspects of Martin's uh, work kind of reminds me a little bit of like the Aztec Codex Figuration. Do you think that's too much of a, a stretch? Uh, I I actually don't think it's uh, it's a stretch. Uh, there's only one uh, example, and I I don't have it here to show, but uh, Ramirez did do a figure of um, an an Aztec full figure, and there's there's only one, but it's clearly. Um, a figure of an Aztec, Aztec uh, individual. I, I, I want to jump in on this. I, I'm not an art historian. I'm not an expert on this. Uh, 
you know, I've been thinking about this, this issue with Ramirez in terms of his architecture and in terms of some of the figuration, especially. Uh, there are remarkable formal similarities, it seems to me, in the way he renders, say, the kind of the elaborate figure of the of the horseman, but also some other figures as well. And I don't have all the images in front of me, or we could do a little kind of art, art historical kind of examination. But um, it, it, you know, I don't know how far you can push this, but there are remarkable similarities. I'll tell you what strikes me about this most recently. It, it clearly comes from a Catholic milieu. Uh, and, and, you know, Victor can talk about this. He was a, he was a believing Catholic. He was part of that place, or he came from that place that was the center of the Cristero rebellion against a secular government in Mexico city. Uh, and people paid the price for that rebellion. Um, but what really strikes me about Ramirez's work is I, I've been thinking a lot ever since the first time I went to Mexico about how the Aztec, it, it's kind of like in the air, or let's call it pre, pre-Hispanic or pre-Columbian ways of making forms kind of are integrated with a kind of Catholic, a kind of Baroque or a, really a Baroque Catholic approach. And Ramirez to me has always been really fascinating as, as a kind of meeting point between those two, between a kind of, again, that, that Baroque Catholicism that you see in, in so much of Mexican art and architecture. And, that, and, and again, Victor's written about the iconography of, of Martin's work. But, but also kind of the formal elements that are kind of in the air in Mexico. And those elements are pre-Hispanic. Uh, and and, and I, I cannot help but feel that Ramirez is, is a meeting place for all those things. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for jumping in right away and asking that question. We appreciate yeah, you. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you had impeccable timing. I saw your name come up as I was looking. <laughs> Um, we are now going to go to a question from Anna. Uh, Anna, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm a fine artist myself, and I do have a few questions. Um, I guess Lyle, Victor, or Frank can answer them. Probably Victor, because he's done the research on Ramirez. Um, question number one, you mentioned a professor from Mexico who had seen his work and he was a professor of psychology. Do you know if that professor of any other um, critics or anybody has done a psychoanalytic approach to interpreting his works, especially in regards to the symbology of his works? Uh, the, yeah, yes. Um, the problem with the uh, psychological analysis done before my research is that they didn't have any information about Ramirez. So they basically look at the drawings and speculate at the possible uh, psychological explanations. And, and some of those, those are from Mexico, are, oh my God, it's uh, very disappointing. Disappointing, but, but they can be justified because they didn't have any information Reference. they didn't have they didn't have access to, to the psychological file they didn't have any information about if Ramirez was psychological or not so one of the problems with when you do a psychological analysis and try to connect with Ramirez are is first you have to show me an evidence that he was psychotic because if we don't have an evidence that he was schizophrenic then the, the speculations doesn't make any sense you know when when people discuss with me about that dimension of Ramirez are the psychological dimension I say Okay, if you are trying to explain to me that this is the product of somebody with psychosis or schizophrenia, in order to start a conversation, you have to first prove to me that he was a typical case of schizophrenia and psychosis. Oh, because I was unaware. Not the conversation ends there. So he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. I was unaware of that. Yes, but but the the diagnosis is very conflicted. Uh, we have information from the file, and you, you we have to go back to the 1930s when he was. Right. When the people did it. He's, right. he's in, a, in, a, in a foreigner area. He doesn't speak English. The doctors don't, don't speak Spanish. They are, you look at the transcripts of the dialogue, it's just, it's just depressing. Okay. So, 
Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, I have a few more questions, and thank you for that. Um, he was intelligent, as we know, and like as you said before, he wasn't necessarily mute. He just didn't talk to us, and probably because of the language barrier. But maybe the doctors, or has anybody found any kind of notes, words, writings, either on the back of his work or in a journal, any kind of script, words, anything, references that he used? Or the is, written is word? Are, is that include many words? His art include words, but not that narrative. There is not any, didn't survive any narrative. We, we know right. that he right. sent letters to his family. Oh. But the letters also are very complicated. Uh, and I don't cite those letters in my book because that information also is very confusing. But one of the, the, the oldest Ramirez daughter, the one who need to remember more about her father, of course, she, she already died. But she once told me that the letters that the family were receiving from Ramirez from the institution, because he sent letters when he was already in the institution. Uh, and he, 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 before, too, because he was selling money for the United States. Uh, the oldest daughter told me that they were difficult to follow. And some where he mixed words in Latin and the words were a uh, complaint against, against his wife. And for the family, they were just evidence of Ramirez's mental illness and they destroyed it. They were, they were offensive to them. So there, there is not any, didn't survive any document where Ramirez says something. It's only right. the text including the drawing. Right. That are mostly mostly words, not right. sentences. Right. Um, and my last question is in um, regards to the arches. Were those the last? And Frank, with your with your exhibit, um, with the arches and the arcade and the repetition of the arches, were those the works that were done towards the latter part of his life? They were done. So they were most of the arches were done between. 1958 or 1959 and 1962. Hello? Hello? Yes, you're back. Okay. Uh, Do you know what year he died? 63. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I just want to add one more thing. You, your gentleman talked about visual references or memory portals. Do you think perhaps though, in regards to Ramirez and, you know, again, it's just a question and it's open. Do you think perhaps that he could have also touched within his intuitive intelligence to bring some of these images forward out on paper, working from his intuition as well? Well, Ramirez, as I said, in, in my opinion, was born with a gift. So whether you call the gift something that is intuitive or whether something, whether it's something that has been developed over time, it started with a gift. And from the gift came everything else. Thank you so much, Anna, for your questions today. Uh, and thank you, um, Frank and Victor and Lyle. Uh, we have uh, one more audience question. Uh, we are going to go to Jeffrey Wolf. Jeffrey, I'm going to pass you the mic now. Hi, guys. Um, I've done Hi, Jeffrey. Little... Hi. Um, there, there are a few things that kind of got left out of this discussion that I wanted to jump in with. Um, uh, one big one is I, I do think it's an immigration story as much as it is an art story. And, um, you know, Victor and I have talked a lot over the years about uh, the situation in Sacramento when Ramirez got arrested. He, he was by himself because many of his compatri compatriots who had come up with him had deported. left. They, well, they self-deported, actually. Yeah, they self-deported, exactly. And, um, you know, so I, I think that immigration story is a big part of, of the story. Um, and, like, like, you know, we, we talked about Yoakum, but I, I think that like a lot of, um, you know, I know a lot about Trailer, but Trailer uses built environments as sometimes a center of his piece and then works out from it. I think that, um, you know, we have, and then in talking about the myths, we lose the fact if you go to DeWitt, it's these, it's, it's, it's a little village. And there was a theater there with a proscenium stage and, 
you know, you can kind of get into the world that he lived in a little more clearly than what we imagine that world to be. And um, like, for instance, Pasta wasn't the only person who ever talked to Ramirez. There was a guard in the building um, that claims that he took, he was the one who collected all the, the drawings from Ramirez. So, and he often gave him suggestions as to what to draw that Ramirez never took up on. Um, you know, so, and, and then um, they also, Victor, I think could talk more about that, but they also took field trips outside of the institution. So if you wander around Sacramento, you <clears throat> see the exact um, stone tunnels that he used, which probably um, were closer to what he was using as reference than what he remembered back from Mexico. Um, and then and specifically in, in the horse culture, not only was he from a horse culture, horses, they would do, dis, uh, how do you say it? Uh, Dessaz, Dessaz, tournaments on a, just on a platform. They would do these right. tournaments that people would come see and the horse would, would actually perform within that small radius, which very much often looks exactly like the Caballeros in terms of the- Yeah, it's, of, fun, you know, it's funny you mentioned that, Jeff. But I, I just want to finish one- That concept. was in the back of my mind all, you know, I was trying to place where I was thinking about that kind of image. And that's a, that's a really interesting example. I, I just said, you know, so I think that the politics, which I think there are a lot of, I think that he used the way uh, Darger may have used the, you know, the outline in order to create his, his story. I think Ramirez was using these set pieces of, of uh, history and observation as part of the language that he built all the, all the drawings on. Mm -hmm. And you often, you often enough see a parade horse. Um, and of course, in, in Mexico, uh, any opportunity whatsoever for a parade, and a parade always included parade horses. Yes. So I, mean, I just want to throw that in, and I also, yeah. just as a as an evolution story, I I did a show at Phil's Kimes with Elijah Pierce in the early '70s, and that's how I first saw Ramirez in the gallery, and 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 rather than pay me the commission for the show that I did, she. She asked me if I would take a Ramirez instead, which um, I probably would have spent that money long ago, but still have the Ramirez, so. That's great. Life is good. <laughs> that's great. Life is good. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thank you, Jeffrey, for sharing those thoughts and your questions with us today. Um, and thank you again, Lyle and Frank and Victor for, for all of your thoughts. Um, we are now going to go to our final, final question. Um, from the Rails own Fong Bui. Fong, you can unmute at your will. Fong is always unmuted. <laughs> Thank you, Lyle. Thank, Thank you, you, Frank, Victor. Um, I'm so distracted. I'm so going to be finished by editorial, mm -hmm. but I can't help but listen in to what you all have to say. Uh, it's amazing. I just want to add what you said earlier, Lyle, about those portals the space behind, which have nothing. Actually, the reason why it, it exerts such a monumental presence, in some way, the space itself kind of reminded us those Colosseums, you know, which is a construct that framed the violent, the some sort of spectacle of violent, which the Roman was so good at, uh, only intensified the kind of safety for the Roman to look in what is happening. So this, the, that space have some resonance of something hidden below. And actually when I was there looking at the show with my friend Shasha Gauta Washerman from the Guggenheim, I jokingly say to Frank that uh, Donald Judge should be, you know, maybe shown alongside with those Ramirez, just like the way that you suggest, Victor, uh, of Wayne T. Bone and Ramirez. Uh, it's absolutely true. And uh, actually, Frank and I have dinner together with, with his partner, Alexander Rossi, that we're going to be mounting a huge show based on what just 
been say here. Um, it's going to be in May. There's going to be multiple locations. And in heaven also just we read Will Whitman Democratic Vistas for the 10th time in my life. <laughs> late last night. So the show will be called The Taught and the Self Taught in Democratic Vistas. So it's going to be selections of works of art of very well known artists and lesser known artists cross generation and will be mounting install alongside, not against off, alongside with works of art made by self-taught artists. And I think it's gonna be the biggest show the Rail Kill Tour project ever put together up to date. And then I can go back to Vietnam in peace. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very excited, you guys. It's gonna be, and I'm, you all is gonna get involved because the idea is to eliminate the division between academic training and vocational study and vice versa, which is Tom Dewey spent his whole entire life to work on this such premise. And um, so the unity of this uh, you know, effort will give back the pleasure and the power of the viewer who then can decide on their own terms. There's no framing of political structure. There's no academic analysis whatsoever. And so, uh, yeah, I wanted to share that. And, uh, and then maybe we all can come together and celebrate because I have the feeling May will be the end of Omicron. And hopefully we'll come together and heal ourselves through these works of art. Yes, indeed. So back to you, Ty. Thank you again, Victor, Lyle, Frank. I see you super soon. Grazie mille. Thank you so much. Bye, Fong. <laughs> Bye, Fong. <laughs> uh, and what an optimistic note to end on. I too think that we're going to all be commuting uh, in person soon. Uh, and now I'm really excited because here at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending all of our community events with a poetry reading. And today I am more than thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Lily Lady, to the stage. Writer Lily Lady is based in New York City. Their work can be found in Blush, Bureau of Complaint, and House of Theodora. Lily's forthcoming book, Quickie, will be published by Dream Boy Book Club in spring of 2022. And Lily, you can take it away now. Thanks, Ty. Um, thank you everyone for sticking around and thank you so much to Brooklyn Rail for having me. I'm going to read one poem. It's called Things I Am Afraid Of and I encourage all of you to write your own version of this poem. <clears throat> Things I Am Afraid Of. Dead parents, baseball game foul balls, leaving New York, my infertility, straight women who use the phrase girl crush, Vacation aneurysm, breaking a nail, blood panel results, Dr. Valente, chipped teeth, Sunday crossword, crow's feet, simple carbohydrates, appendicitis, never leaving New York, TMJ, my fertility, teenage drivers, toxoplasmosis, facial sunburn, dressing butch in Midtown, losing my retainer, Retinoblastoma, staying out of fear, forgetting the plot, midnight hunger, monogamy, E. coli, dentist noises, Dr. Lynn, honesty and therapy, Dr. Allison, incest dreams, adult drivers, the sound of a paper towel ripping in half, weighted blankets, non-monogamy, eating before 11 a.m., degenerative vision, mom's bony wrists, four-way stoplights, projectile vomit, any kind of vomit, four-digit rent, my teeth shifting, idiot doctors at urgent care, less idiotic doctors elsewhere, the oxygen level in malls, loud vacuums, reading this, osteoporosis, performance reviews, the smell of acetone, every scene in E.T. with E.T., <laughs> amoeba, 
Biting into a pear, disaffected irony, Martin Screlly, dad's repeated stories, leaving the gas in the stovetop, my chin hairs, mad cow disease, sending a Zoom private chat to the everyone chat, generational debt, high sodium microwave meals. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily. What um, I was really having a really lovely time listening to that and um, am in agreement with you about many of them. Uh, thank you so, so much. And uh, thank you again, Lyle and Frank and Victor um, for what an incredible event today. And uh, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel or we'll upload today's conversation shortly. Oh, and thank you again to everyone at Rico Maresca, including Alejandra and Kylie, um, so lovely. Uh, and please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for our 70th Radical Poetry Reading, curated by Billy Chernikoff, featuring Maggie Louisa Zovgren, uh, Elizabeth Robinson, Kirsten Eanes, and MTC Cronin. And now you can all turn on your microphone and say goodbye or hello or list your fears as you leave. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oh, thank you so much. Great poem, Lily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Lyle. Great moderation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the Beautiful reading. Thank you. Frank. Thank you. Woo! Frank, thank you. Woo thank you. Woo wee. <laughs> all right. Thanks for two. All right. Thank you. Bye all. Thank you all. Let's get hey, some all lunch. Thank you so much. We need to get some lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Frank. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Alan. Ciao.